Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this week's uh, mentoring hour. It's uh, wonderful to see you all. I hope you all are doing well. Uh, before we get started, uh, can I request one of our students to uh, open with a word of prayer, please? Uh, any one of our students could please unmute and pray. It would be great. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you once again for this uh, time of mentoring. We, we pray that whatever we're going to learn today, Lord, that you'd lead us, Lord, that you'll minister to us through your word, Father. And we'll be able to apply whatever we've learned in our own personal lives, Father. We also pray for a blessing upon our entire faculty and all the students here in the Bible College. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sanjay. Um, okay, uh, so welcome uh, once again. Um, you know, we today we will have a general question and answer sessions uh, where you are welcome to ask questions uh, regarding uh, any biblical topics or any questions that you had uh, regarding uh, theology or the Bible or life in general or ministry. Um, I want to welcome you to please post your questions on the chat section. Um, we have our faculty uh, present, and uh, we would be very delighted to ha answer those questions. Um, but before we could get started, uh, there were two questions from last week which were not answered due to time. Um, so we're going to start off by addressing a couple of those questions. Okay, So uh, sharing the question in the chat section, uh, one of the questions was from Komal. Uh, and Komal had asked, I know one family, uh, in that family, one boy cannot speak. He is dumb and he is not a believer, but the whole family is a believer. So the family are asking for water baptism for that boy. So some pastors said he cannot speak because of that we cannot give him water baptism. So what should we do for that boy? Uh, what sh uh, should we, sh we should be? give or not um so that is the question so uh so we there's a family in the and there's a person in the family who is uh, unable to speak who is dumb and uh uh the question is uh the family wants uh, him to be water baptized uh but some of the pastors have said uh you know without his consent uh we cannot give him water baptism uh, or without his agreement or without hearing what he has to say uh, or expressing his desires uh, so can we give him that person water baptism or or not? Um, can I request one of our faculties to please uh, respond to that question? Right, uh, Pastor Nancy, may I request you to uh, address that question? Well, yes, share, share sure. your thoughts, yes. Yes, yes, sure, Pastor Roshan. Um, so quite an interesting question there. So I think the the issue here is to understand whether that boy is a believer or not. If we have evidence to that fact that the boy is a believer, he can be given water baptism. So uh, the way we will understand that is, See, in day-to-day -day life, I'm sure he's communicating in some way, even if he's not able to speak. Um, it's possible to know what he wants, uh, you know, about other things. So similarly, if, uh, you know, the family can understand what he is saying, maybe they can talk to him. Uh, I'm assuming he can hear. So if they can talk to him and then if there's a response from him where we, we know that, you know, he is confirming or affirming his faith, uh, water baptism is the next step to someone who has received the Lord Jesus as their personal savior. So it's just a matter of ensuring that he's a believer. So I think some form of communication is possible. And uh, if he's able to write, then I, I maybe, uh, you know, some, some kind of a, um, script, then even then they can confirm it. Uh, so the point is we need to know whether he's a believer or not. Right. So if he's not a believer, we cannot go ahead. Right. right. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Pastor Nancy. Um, okay. Uh, 
Is there anybody else who would like to share their thoughts? Uh, any other faculty? OK. Um, it's Pastor Nancy, and I, I think I agree with you uh, in terms that, um, that there's some form of communication is possible. Uh, and uh, I'm just reminded of uh, um, my father-in-law uh, who had a brain stem stroke and uh, he was locked in his body meaning he was uh, kind of paralyzed but he could feel um, and you know uh, but he just couldn't move and uh, it's so much so that even um, only a one set of his eyes could move and uh, his daughters uh, one of whom i'm married to is uh, i mean they trained him to respond to questions in a sense that uh, if we, if it's a yes to just blink or close an eye that is functional and uh, and with that uh, way of communication uh, they uh, god understood that his desire to uh, accept the lord and also to be water baptized uh, so, so uh, yeah, and I feel if we can establish some form of communication, which I'm sure is uh, possible, as you mentioned, uh, we can we can go ahead. Uh, thank you for answering that question. Um, uh, we also have another question. Uh, we had another question um, last week um, from Lucy. Uh, okay, and Lucy had shared. Uh, how could I help some of our relatives in our family who still go to pilgrim centers for cutting their hair as a practice from years, which was followed? Uh, how can I help them with scriptures? So, so how can I help, uh, how can Lucy help some of her uh, family members who are still practicing uh, their customs and the traditions? Uh, how can I help them with scriptures is what Lucy is asking. Uh, can I request? Uh, a faculty to respond to that, please. Uh, thank you, Lucy, for your question. Um, I think uh, you can just tell them that it's not the outward ob uh, observance of rituals and laws that is going to uh, make us righteous in God's sight or is not going to justify uh, our sins or is going to wash away our sins because uh, uh, like you can quote scripture passages like uh, salvation is in no other name but in the name of Jesus. Um, if you confess to your mouth that Jesus is Lord then you will be saved um, and uh, that we are made righteous uh, by grace through faith. So that is what Paul also talks in Romans. So you can um, talk about these uh, scripture passages and also maybe uh, share with them uh, Matthew 23, uh, um, verses 25 to 26. And in this passage, Jesus basically is rebuking the religious leaders of his time, the Pharisees, for their... Uh, uh, basically for their hypocrisy and for their uh, external focus on, uh, you know, rituals and ritual purity while uh, neglecting their inner transformation. So uh, Jesus is comparing them to whitewashed tombs that look beautiful on the outside, but, uh, you know, full of, uh, uh, you know, dead bones uh, uh, inside. And basically they're impure on the inside. So. Uh, the key message is that, you know, true righteousness basically involves more than outward appearance and it requires purity of the heart and uh, genuine obedience uh, to God's um, command. Um, also, if you look at, um, you know, what God tells uh, uh, the prophet uh, Samuel, that, you know, uh, obedience is better than uh, sacrifice. Okay, so I think these scripture passages uh, can help in in telling them that it's not about uh, doing things or giving uh, things. Uh, that is not what God requires of us, but um, what he's more interested is um, in our obedience to his word and us loving him, which is uh, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind and strength and to love our, our neighbor as ourselves. I hope that uh, helps. Yeah. Thank you, Roshan. 
Thank you, Pastor Selina. Um, um, uh, Lucia, is, sorry, Pastor Nancy, please go ahead. Sorry to interrupt you there, Pastor Shin. I just wanted to uh, thank you, Pastor Selina, uh, and just wanted to add one more point to uh, what Pastor Selina shared. So in the New Testament, we see, especially in the book of Hebrews, that the Lord Jesus has become that perfect atoning sacrifice through whom we now have received salvation. And so uh, many of the temple practices which were followed, where people were sacrificing things um, and matter, that has now changed. So for us as believers, we don't have to engage in those kind of rituals anymore. And we see a verse from 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, which says that we are now living stones being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So now we are part of the new covenant and what God expects from us is to um, offer up spiritual sacrifices. So just wanted to add that one point. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Nancy. Uh, Lucy, do you have a follow-up question uh, that you'd like to ask? OK, so, all right, thank you. Uh, great, I um, want to encourage uh, every one of us to keep your questions coming. Um, we will uh, try and respond to that as much as possible. <clears throat> Excuse me. OK, uh, we have a question from Joseph. It says, uh, so his question is, does getting angry repeatedly give Satan an opportunity? Is Satan responsible for anger? Okay, does getting angry repeatedly give Satan an opportunity? Uh, is Satan responsible for anger? Well, again, uh, I request one of our faculties to respond to that question, please. Um, okay, I'll just share my two cents on this. Well, um, anger, like every other emotion that we have, uh, is neither good or bad. Uh, we feel, you know, happy. We uh, we we talk about several uh, of the so-called positive emotions. Similarly, God has given us anger as well, which is an emotion, and um, uh, it's like a thermometer. Uh, like we can we can assess what's going on within us by these emotions. So uh, uh, so you know anger in itself uh, is is not evil, but the management of anger is what you know we should be concerned about. So all of us do get angry, um, and uh, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter four. Uh, you know, in verse 26, it says, uh, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. So it, it is it is understood that there will be times when we do get angry. But how do we manage it? So when we manage it well, we do not have to sin because we got angry. It can be a righteous anger and it can be dealt with in a proper way so that the outcome is uh, positive. Uh, so, you know, that is about anger. And uh, I just look at Joseph's question again. Does getting angry repeatedly give Satan an opportunity? So, yes, if, you know, it's not a, a righteous anger and we are constantly getting angry and uh, it is affecting our relationships, then yes, obviously it's giving Satan an opportunity to work in our lives. And, um, is Satan responsible for anger? So having said that anger is an emotion given by God to us, I don't think we can we can put the sole responsibility on Satan. Uh, yes, he's a tempter, but it depends on how we manage our anger. So uh, yeah, it finally boils down to managing anger the right way. So that's uh, my view, and I'll just uh, leave it open for others also to share. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Nancy. Thank you. Joseph, do you have a follow-up question to that? Or uh, any of our other faculties would like to add to that, please? Uh, I'd just like to share uh, from Ephesians chapter 4, verses uh, 31 and 32, where 
you know, Paul is advising us to get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. It says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. So this, uh, this passage encourages uh, believers to manage their anger in a constructive and godly manner. Uh, and like Pastor Nancy said that, uh, you know, Satan is uh, often not associated with temptation and sin. And he's not directly responsible for uh, uh, human emotions like anger. Uh, but anger is a natural human uh, emotion. And uh, feeling angry is not sinful, but we need to learn how to manage our anger in a constructive and a godly manner, like she also pointed out to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 and 27. So if we repeatedly uh, give in to anger and allow it to control our actions, it can uh, lead to sinful behavior and can damage uh, relationships um, as well. And so it's important that, um, you know, we learn to... Um, uh, you know, ask the Holy Spirit uh, to help us in this area, uh, to uh, fill us and also to, you know, uh, to meditate on scripture, to fill our hearts and mind with, uh, with the word of God uh, so that, you know, uh, we can bear the fruit of the spirit and, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit can sanctify us and uh, help us. So sanctification helps um, as to the extent that we, um, you know, allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. So if this is uh, uh, anger is an issue and it's a problem and it's something that's troubling you, then you can ask the Holy Spirit to take control and to help so that it doesn't give an opportunity to the, to the evil one uh, to take control of your life and to lead you to do things that can be harmful and destructive. Yes. Thank you. Over to you, Pastor Roshan. Thank you, Pastor Sam. Thank you. Right, um, Joseph, I I hope that's answered your question. Um, thank you. Awesome. Great. Thank you, Pastor Nancy. Thank you, Pastor Selena. Um, there's a lot of wisdom in that uh, answer. Uh, you know, a lot of my friends would be surprised that I'm a pastor because uh, 18 years ago, um, if you had met me, uh, the one of the tags that I had was uh, Roshan equals short-tempered person. So I didn't think I'd be qualified enough to answer that question, but uh, yeah, I think I've gotten better. But okay, uh, let, let's move on. We have a question from Jafina. Okay, so I have a question uh, from First Corinthians chapter eleven, verse ten. Um, she's seeking understanding. Um, it says, "For this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head." Uh, because of the angels, right? Um, I believe it, it's it's uh, the very famous, uh, well-known uh, chapter in First Corinthians chapter eleven, talking about the covering the head in worship, and that is the context of um, at least the first section um, from verse one to sixteen. But um, again, I'm just going to uh, request one of our faculties to respond to that question and um, and give some context uh, to it. Okay, thank you, uh, Jeffina, for your question. Uh, so when we interpret what Paul is writing, especially to uh, the various churches, uh, where he's writing uh, this to the church at Corinth, or um, he's also uh, mentioning about uh, similar things in, in the book of Romans and Timothy, we need to look at it and study it in, in the context. So here, uh, basically, uh, Paul is... Um, is talking about uh, you know uh, uh, the order and a uh, deco de uh, uh, decorum that is needed within the Christian uh, community uh, in the church, and uh, so he's particularly talking about uh, gender roles and head covering during worship. So he's suggesting that women should have a symbol of authority uh, on their heads. So you know, so this symbol traditionally is interpreted as you know, covering the head or a veil that uh, signifies a submission and respect for um, authority. So this is particularly in the context of worship uh, gathering. Um, and so, you know, he's saying that uh, in, in, in the, uh, in the uh, church, you know, women uh, should uh, submit to governmental uh, order or structure or the authority that 
has, God has placed in uh, the body of Christ. So we know that in every area of our lives, God has present, has has uh, uh, kept, uh, you know, authoritative structures or authority structures. So if it's at home, it's the husband who's the head of the home. If it is uh, the church, it is the pastor. If it is uh, uh, the society that we live in, it is the government. And that is why we see Paul writing uh, 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 to Titus, to Timothy, uh, and to the church at Rome and saying, you know, submit to governmental authorities because the Jews were basically um, saying that, you know, God is um, uh, our head. We don't have to obey to uh, or come under any, we don't come under any human governmental authority or structure. And then, uh, uh, so, and the workplace, we have our bosses. Uh, so God has placed governmental structures or authority in every sphere or area of our lives. And it is, um, uh, what he requires of us is that we submit to these authoritative structures that he has placed. So he's basically saying that women have to submit to men uh, 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 in the church, like uh, uh, like even when he's writing uh, to Timothy, uh, the church is at uh, Ephesus. You know, uh, women had an upper hand because of the uh, of the goddess uh, 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 Diana that was worshipped there. So there were a lot of um, uh, 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 priestess that were serving in the temple of uh, Diana. And so when uh, these people were coming into uh, the church and they becoming believers, they thought you know they could also uh you know uh, exercise their authority uh, in the church but paul tells them that you know they need to be quiet and uh you know they're not allowed to preach and teach it does not does not mean that you know women are not allowed to preach and teach or keep quiet so in the same context here as well we see that this is basically uh, in regard with the decorum uh, and the church order, and he says, you know, uh, that uh, uh, covering their head is a symbol of authority. And the phrase, because of the angels, has been interpreted in various ways. Uh, some scholars suggest that it refers to angelic being observing worship service and therefore emphasizing the importance of keeping proper decorum and orderliness in worship. And other scholars uh, say that, you know, it indicates spiritual significance of symbol of authority in the presence of God and his heavenly um, beings. Uh, but basically to understand this verse, the, uh, it is uh, important that we honor God uh, with the, uh, the order and authority structures that he has established in the uh, uh, church. And um, not that women have to cover their head for any other per, uh, specific reason, but uh, just uh, for this, yeah. Over you, over to you, Pastor Roshan. I hope that helps, uh, Jeffina. Thank you, uh, Pastor Roshan. Just want to add uh, something. Uh, thank yes, thank you, uh, Pastor Selena. So, as Pastor Selena shared, because of the situation uh, in that Corinthian context, Paul had about head coverings, right. and uh, just want to also add the fact that you know when. There is head covering involved, especially here. Um, now, it, it may kind of sound like to express the acceptance of uh, authority or in order to express our submission, you know, that head covering is um, required. But we must understand that it was only in the Corinthian context. And uh, it was, um, with, as Paul writes, so he says, like, if a woman is married, then uh, you know, she needs to cover her head. Um, so wives in uh, other passages, we see um, in Ephesians 5, again, honoring the institution of marriage, uh, where uh, Paul writes to the, the women, married women, he says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. So it's um, this particular head covering thing matter uh, here is very specific to the married women. So women who were married were asked to cover their heads. And uh, also just want to point out that as we look at um, verse uh, 16, uh, 16, it says that there are no such custom in the other churches of God. So, you know, it's not like a blanket rule which was asked to be done. And uh, with regard to the angels, yeah, I think Pastor Selena has already explained that. So. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Pastor Nancy. Uh, thank you, Pastor Selena. And uh, thank you, Jeffina, for your question. 
Okay. Um, is, is there a follow-up question, Jafina, that you would like to ask, or are you satisfied? No, bastards. All right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, right let's move on. Uh, we have a question from John Paul. Um, the question is, uh, in our study on ministering healing and deliverance, we have learned that a believer cannot be possessed, but be oppressed by the devil. Being possessed by the devil shows part-time or full-time manifestations. Um, we also have seen in some cases that believers manifest while praying. Uh, does this mean being oppressed also can show a certain level of manifestation? Um, thank you, John, for that question. Um, right, um, so, and uh, Pastor Nancy, can I request you to uh, respond to that? and? Yes, yes, sure, Pastor Roshan. Uh, thank you, John, for that question. And uh, the the answer is a yes. So one need not be possessed to manifest. Even oppression can display some sort of a manifestation, uh, you know, in certain cases. So I hope that uh, helps. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Um, Yes. Yeah, I would just, uh, you know, concur with uh, Pastor Nancy there, because uh, I mean, there, there's always an, a response to any kind of oppression. Like even if you take uh, simple examples, like uh, if a nation is oppressed or if a group of people are oppressed, um, there is a response or a manifestation is just an expression of their response and um, they would respond some way if, if a person is oppressed by say depression of some sort um there is a way they behave uh, right and that's just man that's that's how they manifest in terms that's how they express and so yeah don i hope that answers your question but if you would like to ask a follow-up question uh please yes, uh, yeah, that answers yeah thanks awesome okay thank you um great uh keep uh posting your questions um, as we have, and uh, we would love to respond to them. It's a general question and answer session. We, as you've noticed already, we do not have uh, a, a topical uh, discussion uh, this week. So if there's been a burning question in your heart regarding the Bible doctrine and the Trinity and, and the theological questions, uh, please feel free to share questions regarding ministry and life in general. Please feel free to share. Okay, uh, while we wait for the questions to come in, which I'm sure will come uh, very quickly, uh, I'm going to ask, um, Pastor Nancy, do you have any favorite, uh, any of your favorite encounters with God uh, or in your in your journey so far that uh, that you hold very close to your heart? Okay. One or two, maybe? It's fine. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I wasn't expecting this, so it's a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, a surprise. Mm, there are too many. I just I, I'll just probably talk about whatever I can remember now. I think uh, uh, encounters during worship, I would say, and this is as a child because uh, uh, my mother would take me to some of these. Um, those days, you could have crusades, and you know every small ground around our home, uh, there there'll be something going on, and so she would take me with every opportunity and uh, so uh, in those worship sessions um, most of those um, you know worship sessions had uh, uh, they would do it in the local language and uh, i cannot forget the the kind of experience i had of the love of god you know words cannot express what one exp uh, um, what one experiences and uh, i feel like um, some of those sessions were rather long, but it would always feel like uh, we just walked in and it's already over and you never want to get out of it. In fact, in one of those worship sessions, I still remember very clearly that uh, it was an ordinary evening, uh, but during the worship, uh, it was literally like there was a cloud uh, over that group 
as we were worshiping the lord and as a child i mean i had no reference uh, like i hadn't read a lot of the bible and i mean forget about you know read uh, reading there was no question of understanding it but i didn't even know about the presence of god being like a cloud but uh, i did experience that and that, that's something that i can never forget uh, and it always comes back to me the the powerful presence of god and encountering god in that way so yeah that's one that i suppose i can think of right now and yeah thank you pastor rishan thank you for sharing pastor nancy that's that's, uh, that's wonderful thank you uh, all right we're still waiting for questions to come in um please keep them coming and uh, right, uh let me ask pastor selina the same question that's okay <laughs> yeah so so i think uh, encounters with god is uh, one was uh, you know when i was in bible college and uh, i uh, i was all, uh, basically thinking of the whole significance of the lord's supper what it really means and uh, and all that and i was just sitting there in the chapel and praying and we were uh, you know they were serving communion and then i just uh, you know saw this whole i i just saw this whole thing in front of my eyes i saw jesus and he just showed me his um, his uh, uh, head that was bruised with the crown of thorns and um, uh, his hands which had uh, you know bore the the nail marks it was so deep and it was uh, just such a powerful encounter that it just you know i just was just crying there and it just put a whole new significance to the uh, to uh, partaking in communion what god has done what jesus has done for me on the cross the significance of that of course later on when i came to apc i learned more about uh, the significance of uh, 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 of uh, partaking in the lord's uh, table uh but you know this encounter was very very powerful it was very real uh the other thing uh, yeah i think i'll just stop here because we have a question from esther and right. rose lydia right. over to yes. you pastor roshan right thank you for sharing that uh, pastor selena thank you thank you both pastor nancy and pastor selena thank you okay so uh let's go back to questions here we have a question from esther um says uh, how to not get discouraged and feel down when people accuse you of past instances whenever they are confronted or asked to explain their present activities which are not acceptable in the sight of god and man um, how to not get discouraged and feel down uh, when people accuse you uh, of past instances uh, whenever they are confronted or asked to explain th their present activities which are not acceptable in the sight of god and man uh, esther would you also like to uh, elaborate or uh your question and explain a little, just a little bit more of you uh yes sir uh, dear pastor roshan uh what i was uh just a normal instance which happened uh, yesterday like two of the people were not in uh i mean they were at the drop of a hat they were trying to pick up a fight over uh uh, something very very trivial issues and then uh, why don't we forget the past and go forward uh, is what uh, they were saying and instantly uh, they started saying last time also you did this so instead of forgiving and forgetting uh, people at a drop of a hat try to bring back the memories uh, where one got offended and then even after repentance because uh, god forgives and forgets so right. whenever there is an issue and when people uh, go back and start accusing so uh, we as human uh, nature we again uh, bring to our remembrance and maybe feel down uh, and not get interfere when people are I mean, it's, it's good to make peace between people but then this may be a repercussion so how do we deal with this right thank you for explaining your question esther uh, right, i'm going to again uh, refer back to our faculty to please uh, respond to this question any one of them okay yeah oh uh, pastor if you have something you can please go ahead no no i was going to ask <laughs> oh you're going to ask okay great thing Yes, thank you, uh, Esther. Thank you for sharing. And sorry to hear that 
you know you had to go through this difficult uh, situation so i think the way to keep ourselves strong in the midst of such accusations is to uh just be clear right uh yes we may have made mistakes in the past you know that uh, people know about and if we have dealt with it in the right way with god and set our relationships right with people we know that we have accepted the forgiveness of god and uh, uh you know the the forgiveness of god you know as as we uh, study once we come confessing and we are genuinely repentant before the lord like you know 1 john 1 7 to 9 we know that god forgives us and we've received it now people may keep bringing it up uh but we must not let that affect us personally so that's what i would say because we know that we've dealt with those issues earlier and uh so we still remain strong when people are bringing it up over and over again and uh, in case we are not able to stop them uh, yeah let them say what they want to but at least we know that this matter is under the blood of jesus so you know that's what i would say i like to just uh, share something pastor roshan uh, regarding uh, esther's um, uh, query Uh, so Esther, uh, uh, yes, one. You know, we have all of us have our past and our past baggages and our sins, and we know that uh, you know once we uh, uh, confess that to the Lord, uh, you know He has uh, forgiven us. And uh, uh, Romans chapter eight verses one and two says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ uh, Jesus. Also, one uh, John chapter one verse nine says that if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just, and He will forgive us our sins, and you know purify us from all unrighteousness. And just some few encouraging verses for you to uh, remember is Isaiah forty three verse twenty five, where Jesus says, where God says, "I even I am He who blots out your transgressions, and who remembers your sins no more." Hebrews Eight twelve says that you know God forgives. I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins uh, no more. And of course, uh, the famous uh, you know uh, or the very familiar scripture passage, uh, Psalm hundred and three, verse twelve says, "As far as the east is from the west, so far as he's removed our transgressions um, uh, from us." So these are encouraging scripture passages that we can think about and know that yes, you know we have uh, done some mistakes in the past and we have confessed that to the Lord and. Lord is forgiving, and He forgives, and He chooses to forget, and uh, He remembers them no more. So when people accuse us of that uh, again and again, then you know we don't harbor anything against them because it's human nature for them to do it, and we understand. We can understand, uh, you know. They need uh, uh, also spiritual, uh, you know, uh, renewing and help from the Lord. So we pray for them and ask God to help them to be gracious in the way they speak, to be forgiving, and not to keep condemning uh, others. It also helps us and teaches us that you know uh, we also learn to forgive others, uh, not condemn others, and keep going back to their past issues and faults, and uh, look at them the way uh, Christ uh, looks at us. So just when God looks at us, you know He looks at us. Um, uh, uh, just like we have in sin, because we are justified. Uh, uh, we have, um, you know, the righteousness of Jesus has been, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 put on us. We are clothed with His righteousness, and so, you know, He looks at us th that way. And uh, you know, God looks at us just like He looks at Jesus. The same level He has placed us. He loves us the same way, like He loves His. Uh, son. So when we, uh, uh, when we, um, uh, our attitude towards them is uh, to uh, uh, one that is loving, forgiving, kind, gracious, then they will also uh, learn, and it will also enable them uh, to come to the knowledge of the truth and uh, to know God as their personal savior. Yes, I hope that helps. Thank you. Over to you, Pastor Roshan. Thank you, Pastor Selina. Thank you. Uh, or just. I'd like to add just a couple more thoughts in addition to what is already shared. Is uh, I mean, Bible talks about uh, that we cannot avoid offense, uh, you know, in in the Gospels. I think in Matthew, I forgot that I forget the reference. Uh, so offense is going to come our way, and um, there's two ways, uh, two things that I have learned personally in my life. Is one of my favorite scriptures about David in the Bible is from First Samuel, chapter thirty, verse five. 
uh, if you uh, read about David's story from First Samuel chapter 16 and 17 onwards and all the way to 30, there's so many things that happens in his life, how his, uh, uh, his own people uh, betray him, they want to kill him, um, how his, uh, you know, the, the person that he looked up to as a, you know, who's a king um, wanted to kill him, etc. And there's this verse in First Samuel 35 verse 5 says, uh, he, David uh, found his strength in the Lord. Uh, David strengthened himself in the Lord. Um, and so I understand that it's very easy for us to quote scriptures and not, you know, because when we go through life, it's a different scenario. Uh, but but something about that uh, prayer or that line, uh, it's always stayed with me that David found his uh, strengthened himself in the Lord. And I think uh, we can always find our strength in the Lord, no matter what. Uh, the situation of the circumstances, Esther, and we go back to His Word, and uh, and I'm sure you know, uh, we have the Holy Spirit is always there to help us, comfort us, guide us, teach us, etc. Okay, um, all right. Thank you, Esther. Uh, I, I hope that answered your question. Um, uh, yes, it did. Uh, thank you, Pastor Nancy, uh, Pastor Selina, and Pastor Roshan. Uh, indeed, uh, Pastor Selina, you have given uh, the not only just not to get offended, but uh, how we pray about them because end of the day, it is like they treat the others also the same way. With a drop of a hat, it may not be a major issue, like very small, trivial day-to-day -day issues also. When they are, when they are asked to explain they say you also did the same thing so it's right that we have we know and we have to uh, forgive forget and pray about them so that they the, their conversations with people are seasoned and are acceptable to god so thank you so much uh, pastors thank you esther thank you. okay uh, we have a question from rosalind uh, if a person is demon possessed and refuses to recognize and also refuses to get prayed for deliverance, how can that uh, one be delivered? Can the pastor do the spiritual warfare at home for that person's deliverance? Um, a follow up question by Rosalind at the bottom says, especially demons like rebellious spirit and homosexuality. Okay. Um, so let me re read the question uh, for our benefit. If a person is demon possessed and refuses to recognize and also refuses to get prayed for deliverance, how can that one be delivered? Can the pastor do the spiritual warfare at home uh, for that person's deliverance? That's the second half of the question. Um, so once again, I'm going to request one of our faculties to respond to that question, please. Yes. Uh, thank you, Pastor Roshan. Thank you, Rosalind, for that question. As uh, we can recall, we've uh, learned a couple of things in the Believer's Authority course where um, there is a 10-step model by Pablo Botari where he uh, recommends a, a couple of things that need to be done in order to help a person who is demon-possessed. So the initial steps, of course, is to be able to communicate with them, speak with them, to bring them to a place of willingness. If they are still functional cognitively and they can understand us. Now, there are instances where they absolutely will not be able to understand because they are that, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, oppressed by the demons. But in the case where they are able to understand, I think it helps to actually speak, to discuss and uh, to bring them to a place where they are willing. And willingness in the case of deliverance is very important because demons will not leave if the person is unwilling. Uh, and uh, so, you know, that aspect is important. Now, having said that, there is uh, an aspect of a spiritual warfare uh, prior to or during the process when, you know, we are ministering to uh, this particular person where we can be on our knees and fight it out for them. So, um, you know, that that greatly helps. And in addition to that, the willingness of the person. Now, let's say, you know, we've done all of this and the person is still not willing. In fact, in that 10-step model, uh, you know, he says that uh, if when we speak to them, right, like after all this, we speak to them and they say, no, I don't want to be free. Uh, sadly, there we we will have to stop our uh, you know trying to deliver that person at that stage because it's not going to help we can try all we want to cast out that demon but because of the will of the person still wanting 
you know uh, the same life uh, it's going to be very difficult for us to get that uh, demon out so yes some thoughts roslyn i hope it helps thank you thank you pastor nancy uh, roslyn do you have a follow up question uh, what, did that answer your question okay all right okay thank you uh, once again uh, right we have a question from jafina uh, regarding don chapter 9 verse 39 it says uh, jesus said for judgment i have come into this world and that those who do not see may see and that those who see may be made uh, blind i'm just going to continue reading uh, just a couple more scriptures for the context okay um, then some of the pharisees uh, who were with him heard these words and said to him are we blind also jesus said to them if you were blind uh, you would have no sin but now you say we see therefore your sin remains so um i read from verse 39 to 41 for context um question uh, jafina's post is what kind of judgment does jesus talk about here um, pastor selena may i request you to respond to this question please Sure, Pastor Roshan. Thank you, uh, Jeffina, for your question. So here uh, in uh, this is uh, John in in John the Apostle uh, John is uh, you know recording these words of Jesus as part of you know uh, uh, that men were divided over Jesus. Some were accepting him, and uh, some were rejecting him. And this is one way Jesus uh, brought judgment into this world by being that dividing, being a dividing line because some were accepting him and some were uh, rejecting him. So, so when uh, so when he walked on this earth, there was like a dividing line. Some uh, basically accepted and some uh, rejected. So here, uh, you know, uh, when he's talking about. Uh, Jesus is speaking metaphorically about spiritual blindness and sight uh, rather than uh, literal sight or, uh, you know, so he uses the idea of sight and blindness to uh, illustrate a, a spiritual truth. So here the judgment of spiritual understanding uh, uh, is, uh, is brought about because Jesus is referring to the judgment of spiritual understanding or perception. Uh, those who acknowledge their uh, spiritual blindness that you know they are spiritually blind they uh, they their need for god um and uh, and they accept jesus as their messiah they are given spiritual sight uh, they are led into the truth or the truth is been uh, is manifested or known to them uh, on the other hand those who claim to have spiritual insight and knowledge but reject uh, Jesus uh, remain uh, spiritually blind, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So there were many people who uh, desired to uh, know Jesus. They had a need for God. They kept following Jesus, and you know they accepted him uh, as uh, the Son of God, as the Messiah. They were given spiritual sight. But the others who, like the Pharisees, the scribes, the teachers of the law, who were just waiting to you know, judge him, condemn him, and to put him away, uh, you know, even though they had spiritual insight or knowledge, they knew the Old Testament Torah, they knew the laws, uh, but they rejected Jesus, they will remain uh, spiritually blind. So it's basically the judgment of spiritual understanding that uh, uh, is uh, mentioned here. I hope that uh, helps uh, Jeffina. Uh, if you have anything else to ask, you can feel free to ask. Okay, over to you, Pastor Roshan. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Pastor Selena. Thank you, Jeffina, for that question. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for asking your questions. Uh, we have come to the end of the mentoring hour. We do not have any questions that's left out uh, to be followed on next week. Um, so thank you all once again for joining for this week's uh, mentoring. Uh, I hope that there was something that you've learned or from today. Thank you to our wonderful faculty for making themselves available. Uh, God bless you, everyone. Uh, have a wonderful day ahead. Take care. See you.